What's good, everybody? It's been a minute since I've recorded from this angle. Um, but yeah, we are about to get in to the yearly event, the 2020 Musical Favorites, or Musical Notables, as I like to call them. Um, so these are kind of like a lot of different like mini categories that that uh, allow me to talk a little bit about some of my favorite um, music, songs, and and, um, and even bands and artists that I really enjoyed this year. Um, and yeah, it's 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 gonna it, it's be prepared for a long ride. There's been some new cat. If you've been following, there's some new categories that I've been adding. Some tweaks I've been making to to some of the names of some categories as well. Uh, but I'm not pulling the Grammys. Well, maybe I'm pulling the Grammys, but I still do feel it was necessary for me to add a few more. Um, categories due to the fact that my taste has expanded so much more and um, and it, if you watch the channel you'll definitely see where most of that growth has been in so let's go ahead and start off local and I have an honorable mention this time and and the thing is it might be a little surprising maybe maybe um so my honorable mention is cruise tripping by fuelo he's dropped two projects this year no sweat and cruise tripping i was not expecting to hear another project from fuelo for a bit but he came through with another project this month and i was like yo I like this better than No Sweat um, because there's a little bit more songs in here that I can jam and rock out to, and and so it's it's still just an honorable mention. Yeah, because the winner for this, the, my favorite Topeka local album, Topeka local rap album, would have to be mixed not mastered by Seuss. Like, Seuss Mace, man, he, he's been a beast for a while, a long while. And I've always longed for him to put more of his music out that's more readily available other than the CDs that he presses. Um, and and yeah, it's great. There's definitely fan fan bases that love getting physical media. I being one of them, but you know, sometimes it can be tough, especially when you know you're you're trying to reach the whole world. So this is one of the the second um, uh, projects that he's gotten to put out on DSPs and um and i was actually really really impressed um he's always been a really great rapper he's always had a point of view that was that was very um noticeable but he also just had, you know had a bunch of like more off kilter material but this one is very very pointed and a lot of it has to do with today's times and and the political climate and and the way society behaves and even just getting more personal as well with a lot of it and what she's done before as well but i feel like it's it's uh delivered in a way that's much more easy to grasp and also feel and i think that shows so much growth and also the some of the collaborations that got to do with it, it it's it's great and i'll try and go more into depth of that when i get to do a review for it because i have yet to record that review but expect it if it isn't already out yet <laughs> so the next thing um still keeping it local this time we got to go for a tampa local 
So we talk about the Tampa area, and for me, um, I don't have an honorable mention this time, though I, I did debate um, giving one, but this time I, I just felt, you know, I, I, just, I just have to just give it straight out. Favorite local rap album from the Tampa area has to be Robbers by Gats. Um, now, Gats is a person that I got to see, I believe, in the, it was either the 2017 or 2018 Hip Hop Palooza. And I was like, yo, this dude is cool. I gotta like try and keep up with him. And, you know, he, he's dealt a, a lot with sickness um, and he's overcome and got to, you know, go on Rolling Loud uh, multiple times in multiple locations and, and start repping Tampa hard. And the way he blends lyricism and also the hood style that is very common here in Florida, I feel like he has a really nice blend that I enjoy. And even though not every song from that project is something that I want to just continuously come back to, I definitely very much respect a lot of what he's done in those and, and recognize the talent that this young gentleman has. And so out of the, the few um, Tampa local projects that I have heard this one was absolute was my absolute favorite that I've heard um, and it's it, it's a uh, definite he's definitely still an artist that I want to watch um, and I actually need to go back and um, listen to some of his mixtapes that he's re-released on the DSPs as well um, all the different tapes um, the, the colored tapes um, so yeah definitely check him out if you haven't already or you can hear more thoughts on that in my review of Robbers as well. Now my favorite independent collaboration. Now when I say independent collaboration that means just no major label um, affiliation. Independent label work here. Um, and I'm still playing a little fast and loose with the way I <laughs> categorize these because of just how big some independent groups are uh, and labels but um, anyway without further ado I have an honorable mention for this um, Unlocked by Denzel Curry and Kenny Beats this collaboration was so interesting I never ever ever expected it um, to come about like after watching the episode in the cave, I was like, yo, they got great chemistry. And so I guess they realized that and decided to put like a whole cool, interesting visual along with these just gritty, grimy beats and Denzel just spitting it like just having fun over all of all of the beats and, and killing it. And yeah, Un Unlocked was was a very fun project. But there's one collaboration that just happened to do it better. And you can't get any more grimy and, and than getting Alchemist and Freddie Gibbs together. Like, Freddie Gibbs, man, he's, he's cold. He's so cold and charismatic as well. So it's just like, to, to have that over Alchemist, gritty sample base, like like beats like it's just an, another match made in heaven just like with with freddie and madlib like it's just a perfect marriage he he they just it, it just was amazing seriously seriously one of the best rap albums period um but out of the independent collaborations i have to say freddie gives an alchemist now, um, once again, as I was saying, with independent and mainstream, it's kind of fast and loose because the, the way the scene is these days is very 
strange <laughs> because some things seem huge even though it's still independent and some things seem smaller even though they're part of a major so in this case my runner-up for mainstream collaboration is King's Disease Nas and Hit Boy I feel like this project, even though it wasn't necessarily my favorite Nas project, was one that definitely showcased Nas's still impeccable flow, cadence, and rhyme style, but also modernized it a bit with Hit Boy on the production, and it, it's just fantastic. Um, but there's one that I feel did it better and it, it, it may be um, you know bad to really call it a collab a, main, a mainstream collaboration now since they've they've been pretty much a group for <laughs> quite some time but run the jewels for man oh, to hear to hear Killer Mike in LP at it again their 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 chemistry is just too too amazing to not shed some light on and say yo this project is dope it's so dope and they continue to have songs that just get you hype and then also just make you think a whole lot and the way they they ride that line and still have that real punk up energy really is is something that I will always be amazed by if, as they continue to do so. Um, so yeah, that was my favorite mainstream collaboration. Um, yeah, no, sounds sounds weird to say that's a mainstream collaboration, but you know. Hey, um, now on to my favorite independent R&B album. So, um, hmm. so this is interesting because technically my runner up, my runner up has no skips. And then my winner has some sometimes skip, <laughs> but the ones that I don't want to skip on my winter, like, are like in heavy rotation. So, my runner up for the independent R&B album has to be Our Time is Blue by Katie. And, like, it's so, it's so interesting because as I continue to get more and more into Korean music, I am finding some Korean Americans or um, English speaking Koreans who are making music um, that is just, you know, making me be like, yo, they could make it here in the US, like, regardless. Like, I, I think they can do it. They can make it here because the way that they're doing the R&B that is going on here, like in the States, like they match that and sometimes I feel they could top it. Um, but yeah, Our Time is Blue by Katie is an amazing project. No skips on it for me. And it's just a vibe all the way through. But Krim by DaVita, like, oh my goodness. So this was like a brand new discovery because I already knew about Katie um, through the Log Project, but DaVita just came out of nowhere for me and slapped me in the face with the, the lead single of Vita. And then also the other projects on it, I mean, the other songs on the project, I was like, yo, this girl's got it. 
Um, and the reason why I wanted to check out more is because not only did um, I see some reactions to Avita and be like, oh, this is interesting. I went and figured out, oh, snap, she's on AOMG. So she's with the J Park in the gang. Interesting. And got to see everything that she's got going on there. I was like, she is really killing this R&B junk and I am all for it. Not everything is like an absolute winner. It does, that, that makes me want to go like, yo, this is heavy rotation but there are definitely a lot of songs in there that I can put on heavy rotation like some of my favorite songs of this entire year that makes me go yo that's a winner and that's why it's uh, my my favorite independent R&B album now if we go to the mainstream R&B side of things my runner-up has got to be Jaguar by Victoria Monet. Jaguar is oh, such, such a, an impeccable album. It's so good. Victoria, man, like, she's just a great songwriter, and the way she, she just stretched back to the past to modernize it for the day is just, mmm, mmm. But the winner, is good to know by Jojo. Jojo, man, she's back. Jojo, like, back like she never left. She is, like, she had the project before with Mad Love and now back with Good to Know. Oh, man. This, this here, made me go oh this is the this is the jojo lane that i love like mad love had a lot of really great songs i have a lot of favorites on that that junk but this one oh this is this is exactly the 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 lane that I love JoJo in. It's so much more R&B and less pop R&B. And I'm, I'm in it, in it, locked in. And uh, some of them make you just wanna jam. Other ones make you wanna do all the body rolls. The other ones just make you wanna almost cry. You're just like, ooh, I feel you, girl. But yeah. Did this 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 project made me feel things. I was like, yo, I feel you, girl. And that 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 to me deserves favorite R and B album. And I know I I've been listening to a lot of R and B and I know there's been a lot of a lot of praise for a lot of different projects. But I feel like JoJo's project it has not gotten a lot of love in the circles that I'm listening to, you know, talk about music. So I'm going to put some respect on JoJo. But let's move on to our independent pop album. So um, with this, my runner up and my winner are both from the same label. Crazy, right? Um, but the runner up is gonna be Joji with Nectar and this project man um, this was like my f is it my yeah 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 this is my first time listening to a full length Joji project and I was very impressed like I feel like not all of it sounded just com completely moody the entire time which is what I felt like I got from like the few songs that I heard from other older projects and I feel like this one had enough variety and and the songwriting was pretty nice as well and I, I just really loved the vibe that he created throughout the project but the other the other album just knocked it completely out of the park for me and that was Moonchild by Nikki. 
and from start to finish, the variety was there, the songwriting was there, the vocals were there. I love Nikki so much. She's so she's so talented and so amazing. And even her putting it all into the live performance as well was fascinating. And so that was my favorite independent pop album because it experimented with so many different styles with it that you can do with pop music that made me say, yo, this is daring and impressive. I dig it. Now on the mainstream pop album, my runner up happens to be Future Nostalgia by Dua Lipa. Dua has been on a tear. People have been eating up the singles from this project and it's understandably so because it's just a fantastic project. Like I definitely understand why people have been loving Dua so much. And like if she continues to con to bring great music like this, I am going to be a very happy man and I will be following her for quite some time if she keeps this up. But it's not quite the winner. My favorite mainstream pop album was Brightest Blue by Ellie Goulding because to me the the like that whole first part of the project you know outside of like this the singles b-side like brightest blue is a fantastically constructed project and i feel like the journey it brings you on and the different styles and st that that are brought in it are just very very well done and and I was very impressed and it also being one of the, my first times listening to um, this artist I because it was the same thing with Dua Lipa I, it was my first time listening to their full length and I was like yo this is this is great 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 and I I I finally get it. So, I have to, have to, have to give it up to Ellie Goulding. She had my favorite pop album in the mainstream side of things. Now, starting to get to some new categories here. And it's because I've been getting a whole lot of K-pop in my life. So yeah, we extended much more of the K-pop section of my notables because it's become a, it's become a big facet of my life. <laughs> so I'm going to give you my favorite K-pop album from a group. So the only reason, <laughs> <laughs> the only reason why I feel like you know what I'm not even going to mention it yet no no I'll go ahead and mention it the only reason why I feel like I have the order that these two projects are in is for one specific reason um my runner-up, Blackpink the album, is runner-up just because of how much English is in it. <laughs> because I love that album. Like, the album is nearly flawless to me. And, and I just gotta say, I was thoroughly pleased by the group that really made me finally dive into to K-pop like like if like CL and Rain and uh, Seven had had me like trying like maybe like kind of kind of 
dip my toes in just a little bit. Like, they, they, they made me, like, dip my toes in and be like, is it, is it cold? Is it good? Does it feel nice? Black pink made me jump. Black pink is what made me jump. And, and so to hear them come with this album, finally, and it to be as great as it was, I gotta say, I was impressed. But, because of the fact there is so much English, so much English, I felt weird kind of giving it a K-pop album. You know, so... My favorite happens to be Twice with more and more. I never would have thought the day would come where I'd be like, yo, a group that's known for their cute, and bubbly, cheerful music is gonna end up coming out what my favorite K-pop album, for a group, that is. Um, but hey, with more and more, they went a little bit more of a mature route and they still kept that signature twice charm to it like you could just tell it was just like truly taking the sound and just aging it a little bit and that was enough to just make me go all right i cannot front this album is magnificent it is truly marvelous and yeah it's my favorite out of my favorite k-pop album from a group this year but let's get some love to some soloists because i feel it's good to break it up between group and soloists and so these two are later releases in the year and I you know sometimes recency bias can can seem to sway you a little bit but I don't think that it would be wrong to put these as favorites because of the quality the true quality that is in these projects so my favorite K-pop album from a soloist has an honorable mention, and that's Kai with his <laughs> debut. Like, yo, Kai's first album, his first mini album is so, so, so great. It's so amazing. Like, it's awesome and like no skips every one of those six songs just make you go whoa whoa this is just ear candy and it hits it hits right but it's not my favorite because my favorite happens to be better by Boa. Like, once again, a first time listen to a full project, Boa, the queen of K-pop, just showed why she's the queen. And there's only one other person I call queen in K-pop, but unfortunately, her album's delayed, so I don't know what that's going to be like. So for 2020, Boa with Better showed so much, so much of her skill to tackle so many different genres in 11 different tracks, and it made me just say, yo, I get it. I completely understand why Boa has had such a long, illustrious career because she is just unbelievably talented and I loved better. It's, 
it's just it's just amazing so let's continue on the k-pop train here a little bit we're gonna break it down to a song and it it was really ooh, i tell you man like as, as i dove into k-pop there's been so so much music that i've just fell head over heels over so to narrow it down to just one honorable mention and one actual favorite winner is like so so stress inducing but i made it happen so i had to go with the ones that i feel touched me the most and the honorable mention made me cry like i actually well i teared up like you could see the reaction you were not able to see the tears because I, did. I just teared up and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting feelings. Um, but Stella Zhang's Choose You, that song, oh, it's just so beautiful and heartfelt. And I was like, yo, bruh, you can't do this to me. You aren't supposed to make me feel these feelings, especially when I'm not even understanding all of the words yet. That's not fair. I just felt the feeling, the, the emotion, and the delivery that just made me go, yo, this, this is excellent music. This is heartwarming music. This is artistry. But, there was one more song that I heard early in the year that just made me say, yo, this might be one of the most, seriously, one of the most incredible songs I have ever heard this year because I feel the way it was composed, written, sang, produced, everything about it just made me say, yo, this is a like a, an, an incredibly fantastic like crafted song and that that's got to be here we are by g friend that was my favorite song this whole year like choose you came like somewhere towards the middle of the year i believe it was then i was like yo yo this is great. But here we are, came so early, I believe it was February, and I still kept coming back to it over and over and over again, all year, ever since its release. And I was like, this seriously, like all year I was like, I think this might be song of the year contender. It's that good. It is just that good, and yeah, it's it's just epic, epic. So that's my favorite K-pop song of the year. Now let's switch gears, take it back to America a little bit. As a matter of fact, let's head towards the Midwest and look at strange music. So I always do a little section for strange music because you know I just they they hold that label always held kind of a, a, a special little place in my heart so I give it its own little section and my favorite strange music album this year happens to be by the big man himself Tech 9 Interfere and I feel like out of all the strange music material that I've listened to this year it was my favorite it had the most stuff to actually go and return to and um, I feel like it was the album that I feel deserved the recognition of being great especially since I think I may have to retire this category after this year but I don't know we'll see We'll see. But let's keep it on rap music and keep it independent. Because 
my favorite independent rap album also has another honorable mention and that would be Benny the Butcher what Benny the Butcher he's he's an honorable mention yeah burden of proof by Benny the Butcher is an honorable mention it's a nice gritty dark hip-hop classic East Coast New York rap and I just loved it I loved it and it's it's still like the stuff that I tried to not get super into when I was a kid just because I knew the content was a little you know could be a little violent or drug druggy but I always knew that that gritty rap is something that I've always liked and he brought it and as a mature man it's like yo I don't know man I, I, I gotta go ahead and rock with this but there was another independent rap album that came out this year that despite it not being uber gritty super lyrical I just kept coming back to throughout the entire year it was out and that's Boy Lonely by Russell yeah I'm still a Russell fanboy and I feel like this project was was also executed superbly the way it flows from track to track um, and and just all the different vibes that it gives you like it's definitely heavily turn up, but it also still has a story and a lot of really cool witty lines. Uh, it's a, a little bit of melody to, in there that just makes you want to sing along. It just it's just so pleasing to the ear. It's it's the that wonderful blend of catchy and technically proficient. That line that I feel so many rappers these days do not try to do or try to do it poorly. Um, so yeah. Yeah. My favorite independent rap album was by Russell. It was just, it was that good. And I'm really, 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 really looking forward to what he's about to do with Sweetheart coming next year, I'm expecting. Now, especially since now he's with a independent label. He, like, he's with a bigger independent label, um, Rostrum, which is what, you know, Mac Miller and I believe Wiz Khalifa started off on. So I'm really curious to see where that will take him, even if it's a little bit more on his R&B tip. Um, but let's keep it on wrap, switch it over to the mainstream side. And even though my runner up here technically, technically was on an independent rap, a rap um, it was in a, on an independent rap label, I have to say this artist is too big for me not to consider him mainstream. So, Busta Rhymes came back with Extinction Level Event 2, The Wrath of God, and showed everybody why he always considers himself the God MC. Like, Busta went in so many different pockets, so many different flows, so many different styles of hip hop that I had to just respect his efforts. Like, years in the making, he finally released a project and I was just in awe throughout the project. So I had to, had to have to the honorable mention because only one album to me was better and a little bit more concise. And that was Limbo by Amine. Now, when talking about Amine, man, once again, same thing as like Russell. 
one of the very few I feel do a good blend of catchy, like mainstream enough for the radio, but still lyrically proficient enough to be like, ah, that was kind of clever. I, I really dig that. And Amina I mean, hit it out of the park. It was great. It was great, man. Putting off for Arizona. But now, let's move on to some of the more, mm, how do we say, interesting notables here. So, my favorite surprise album that just dropped out of nowhere and it was like, what in the world is this? I was not expecting a project to drop and it just, poof, there it is. Hello, here I am. Has to go to Childish Gambino. Yeah, 31520. This project just came out of nowhere. He's just, it was just like, oh, there's a website out and it's streaming music? That's strange. Let me check this out because uh, Childish Gambino it was supposed to be ended after this. So I definitely got to check this out. And then it finally came out to streaming services and I was like, yo, you get to finally know where it starts because when it was on the website, it just kind of was on a continuous stream until it, you know, went away. So when it finally dropped and you get to hear it in order, starting where it was supposed to start, it was just a great, great experience that I enjoyed. And so that's my favorite surprise drop this year. And now let's move to my favorite throwback album, meaning an album that just had an older sound. It, it's an homage to some retro sounds, um, which was very, 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 very popular this year, not only in the US, but especially even in, in K-pop as well. Like the retro sound was huge, huge. And there's always happens to be some type of throwback album. But for this, there were so many contenders, but there was only one I feel that did it and modernized it absolutely perfectly. And that was the album I mentioned earlier, Jaguar by Victoria Monet. Like the way she was able to capture that funk in this project was so amazing and it was so sexy and you just like yes get it bring it bring it to 2020 i love this and yeah she brought that funk that soul that r and b that black sun and i loved it every little second so that was my favorite throwback album of the year now, my favorite U.S. comeback album, and the reason why I say U.S. comeback album, because now that I be listening to K-pop and stuff, when I say comeback, it, it sounds it sounds like, you know, their version of a comeback. But what I mean by U.S. comeback, meaning you haven't dropped any music in a very, very, very long time. Like a very, very long time. And then you just came back and was like, yo, I'm coming back to slap you all with this great music. And that has to go to Busta. I mentioned him earlier, but this album was just so impressive. The way he was able to bring it back to the past with some classic hip hop and do a little bit of the present stuff. Like a little bit more of the trappier, cloud rappier style. And then even on, because I listened to the deluxe version, he even got to throw in um, like the New York drill sound on one of the songs. And I was like, yo, Busta's killing this junk. Like this was an excellent return to form and just murking everything that he was on. So that was my favorite US comeback. Um, but we also got some curveballs, some albums that you know, had a sound that you just weren't expecting from this artist. And that has to come from Rich Brian. He dabbled a little bit on some of the popper year stuff in 
in uh, the the Mid Midnight Summer Madness. No, Head in the Clouds two, and then also um, a little bit in the Sailor. But in here, like I was not expecting him for a good amount of it to for him to just straight up sing, sing for so much of it. And I was very impressed with what he did. He's still not the greatest vocalist at all, but he still understands good pop writing. And I feel like he executed it rather well when it comes to the composition of the project and of the music. And so, yeah, 1999 by Rich Brian was my curve, my favorite curveball album this year. Now, I always like to do artists to watch, right? So this time, we gotta do it. We gotta add in our K-pop stuff too. So my K-pop soloist to watch has to be, absolutely has to be, Chung Ha. My favorite Chung, my favorite soloist to watch this year was Chung Ha because she was dropping gems all through the year. All through the year. Whether it be some ballads, some collaborations for like OSTs or little side projects, including all the pre singles, pre release singles, Stay the Night, and Dream of You, and <laughs> like play she was dropping events with just pre-release singles that to me was absolutely stunning and astonishing you just had to watch it was a spectacle yet there wasn't the only artist i was watching in k-pop so what k-pop groups did i enjoy watching this year well Dreamcatcher of course yeah Dreamcatcher is a group that you know I heard a lot about last year and got to check out a couple of things I was just like yeah they're okay I like I like the girls a lot but the music mm, I don't know if it's quite for me but that all changed once they started the dystopia arc tree of language is a is, is another just awesome album very 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 good no skips on there man like i can play that mug from beginning to end and just jam the entire time so it was very fun to watch them and then even moving on to the Boca era was was very nice um, and I just gotta say they were fantastic to watch but there was one more group that I feel was even more fun to watch this year and you guys should already know if you've been watching me for a while you should already know Luna 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 Stan Luna <laughs> Luna, man, they've had a fantastic year. Like, ever since they started off this year in February with Isuman taking charge of, like, the whole direction that it was kind of going to go, they have been growing so much in popularity that it is just awesome to watch it's so great to watch i'm so happy to see them continue to grow getting their first win getting so many more new awards getting so many more people reacting and becoming orbits like watching them this year them being on so much more variety shows comp like little competition shows like having them some more people on like mass singer and such um like they have been, and they've been everywhere this year, and I, and even in these COVID times, to see how much they've been working and grinding 
and getting more and more popularity, even becoming a host of Fact and Star, like Chew on Running Girls and Cherry on like the Fisher show. And I was like, yo, they are just doing everything. They're doing everything and I'm loving every second. I'm loving watching these girls. And the music is still flipping amazing. They're still having, keeping up a bit with the lore and everything too. So that's also really entertaining to keep you engaged. And like Luna, man, it's gonna be hard to top them in these in these next years. I'm just saying they're coming for world domination. But let's take it stateside, shall we? Stateside, some of the artists that I had to watch, like when it comes to rappers, my honorable mention is Toby Lou. Toby Lou, man, he is just—he's too dope for words. He's got so much sauce, and. Despite his, like, there's a lot, okay, let's put it this way. There's been a lot of emotional rappers. A lot. A lot. Especially that do a, the bit of more melodic rapping as well. But no one does it like Toby Lou to me. Nobody. Like, a lot of the other people who do that stuff do like more emotional auto-tune singing and stuff. They just sound whiny to me most of the time. And I can't stand it. But the way Toby Lou does it is like sad but still with the confidence hidden underneath like, yo, I'm sad but I I know that I'm still kind of dope though, but things suck. But I'll be cool, right? Yeah, I'm gonna be cool. It's, it'd be great. <laughs> and that's why Toby Lou dropping singles all throughout the year has just been like, it's been really fun to watch him. But there's one more rapper though that I feel everyone. Not just me had to watch. They all were watching what she was doing. Oh, she? Was that a hit? Yeah. Megan Thee Stallion. Should have seen it coming. Megan Thee Stallion, man, she has been on a tear. She released Sugar. She released Good News. She had an incident with Tory Lanez. But she's been very, very engaged. She's been in, in the eyes of everyone. She's been in the eyes of everyone. She's been doing so much this year that it's hard to ignore her. It was very, very fun to watch her this year. Even though I didn't even like all of the material on the projects that came out, you couldn't help but want to check it out at least. And that, to me, star power so she was my rapper to watch in 2020 but what about the singers huh now for the singers it's it's a little bit harder for me to settle on one honorable mention so this is the only time where I break my rule of one honorable mention because it's it was hard I watched, I, they were, they were in, these honorable mentions were interesting to watch for two totally different reasons. See, with Dua Lipa, it was just seeing why so much hype. And then believing in the hype after, like, finally looking in on her side of things. Where her music is, all the stuff that's going on that they, they're doing to try and... The, get her even more buzz with the remixes of the, a lot of the um, album cuts and it's so <laughs> please it has been so so riveting to watch her like wow she's like but she, she still wasn't quite my favorite um but there was another artist that 
I just have to mention, because watching her this year has been interesting as well, despite me not really being into all of the music. Um, but things have been changing around her that I had to like keep an eye out. Um, and that's Taylor Swift. Now, I'm not really, never really have been a huge Taylor Swift fan, but when she did the surprise drop of Folklore and then the follow-up Evermore, like, Taylor has been interesting to, to hear this complete shift of styles once again and for her to continually sharpen her skills in this, in this um, style of music has been very interesting and then even outside of that saying how she's tackling the way the industry works like especially with you know the big deal with between scooter braun big machine like owning her records and then even selling the masters like that stuff has been interesting to watch um despite you know that kind of stuff being actually pretty normal in the music scene but seeing how she has been rallying against that practice um, uh, and how it's getting more and more people to you know say hey that isn't right um, maybe we should force them to change these rules it's been interesting to, to see how much weight her words have um, especially towards her fan base um, and it's and it's also kind of funny that Kanye West is also kind of uh, <laughs> fighting that same fight, despite them not really getting along like that. <laughs> and but you know, Kanye has also done some other bad things, including problems with Masters as well. So he's uh, you know the pot calling the kettle black but that's neither here nor there because we also have the true singer that I had to watch this year that was just been fun and amazing to see and uh, she's been a winner in past years Queen Harvey is just she's she's just always been very interesting to watch and see how she's moving um, and to see that the it, what seems to be the end of an era with the EPs she dropped two of them uh, this year and then also just a few singles after that and seeing the slow move into TikTok and seeing how that is giving a lot of her music second wins and I am excited to see what's gonna happen next for Queen Herbie because I dig her music quite a bit and that gets me excited to see whatever she does um, regardless if it's my favorite thing she's done or just something that I'm cool with um, so yeah Queen Herbie was my favorite singer to watch this year despite all the interesting things in like society wise um, that Dua Lipa and Taylor Swift brought to my table. Now, I'm gonna bring it back to K-pop a little bit again um, because there is a topic in there that I do want to talk about because I feel um, it it levels the playing field a little bit. Um, when it comes to the K-pop scene. So my last two watch artists that I want to bring out are K-pop rookies. Um, now I know um, for the K-pop uh, for the K-pop artists I chose to say to watch, um, I separated in group and soloist, but for this I figured I would just keep it to anybody that debuted, whether it be a soloist or a group, but this time it does happen to be two groups that I feel um, were fantastic to watch and there were a lot of rookie debuts this year that I have been very very interested in so this was hard to narrow down but out of all of the new groups that I've um, acquainted myself with this year my runner-up my honorable mention has to go 
to Secret Number because they dropped two projects, well, two digital singles, um, four songs in total that made me go, ooh, yeah, this is a group to be reckoned with. Um, Secret Number is definitely a, very much a group to watch um, here in, in, I guess it's still considered fourth gen, um, but yeah. They, it's it's they they are they're amazing. <laughs> Excuse me. In the presence they already have, like the international presence that they already have, is astounding. So they're definitely a group to watch. But there's one group that I feel I connected with just a little bit more, and the music itself was just quirky enough that made me go, yo. Something about them is different to me, and that is Wua. Like, Wua, man, is they just have something that, like, that just entrances me. Like, I don't know what it is, but like, when they first debuted with their song, Wua, I was like, yo, this is really fun. Like, I just kind of want to join in with these girls. I want to root for them because something about them just makes me say, yeah, I like them. And even with um, one of their members um, leaving before their comeback um, due to, I believe it was personal reasons, um, like, continuing to watch them with the bad girl promotions, it just made me say, yeah, man, I, I really like these girls. Like, each one of these girls are amazing, and they have some pretty interesting songs, and I'm just really curious where their sound is going to go next. It's like, see, with Secret Number, I feel like I understand their sound and what direction they're going, and I, I, and I like it. I do. I really do. But something about Ooh Ah is a little bit unpredictable, and I like that. I like that, and they're a little bit unpredictable. I don't know exactly where they're gonna go next, but it's something I'm very intrigued to, you know, find out. I'm, I'm very much anticipating what in the world they're gonna come up with next, because it's just so quirky. That makes me say, yo, I want to watch more of them. <laughs> so, um, outside of uh, the rookies, let's talk about some other debuts. Now, um, we have a K-pop debut album that I want to talk about. And this time, the runner-up, the honorable mention, once again has to be Kai. What? I thought you said the album was amazing from start to finish. Six tracks, you just play it and you're on, you're good, and you just vibe and groove and love every second and every bit of that is true. But there was one debut project that I feel I just enjoyed a little bit more. And you just have to give it up to SM for making me love so many of their albums, but dang gone it with Velvet, with like Irene and Sloki was amazing. Monster is just another great, great, great EP. Great debut for their subunit. Like I are like Red Velvet is already like my number two group after falling in love with them last year, going through their entire discography. So I was highly anticipating this, and it did not. I repeat, did not disappoint. And every single one of those songs, as well, were just absolutely magnificent, absolutely fabulous. I just ate it up ate it all up and um, Diamond is like like give me 90s give me 90s Janet vibes all day I'll, I'll be a very happy man because that's exactly what that song gave me and I was like yo I'm happy if it was just this song 
but they, it wasn't just that song. Every single song in there was, was smashes, smashes, and even um, Sogi's um, solo just also gave me chills with the way the, the that vibe and, and the way she executed it. I was just like, yo, every single one of these songs, and including the solo, just I was like, yo, this is this is fantastic. I I yeah. Favorite debut, my favorite debut in K-pop. But what about U.S. debut albums? Well, this one's a little bit in an orthodox picks pick because this has been a group that's been around for for quite some time. So how come it's finally a debut album? Beats me. You'll have to ask them. But Ebony Tusks with Heal Thyself was my favorite debut in the United States. And I feel like even though not everything is going to be super palatable for everyone, including myself, I feel their vision is extremely clear and it was laid down bluntly, concisely, poignantly in this project that I just have to, like, hats off and much respect because it was, it was very, very well done. So, Heal Thyself wins my favorite debut album in the US. So now, after a whole hour and some change, we are, we are getting to the biggest awards song of the year and album of the year so when it comes to song of the year it was it was so difficult to choose so difficult to choose because there's so much great music that I've heard this year. Seriously, so much great music. But I narrowed it down to two. Keep my one honorable mention and keep my one winner. So my honorable mention, the one that was almost song of the year was Celine by Nikki. This song, the instant it dropped, I heard it and I was like, Nikki, no, you did not go the funk disco route right now. Because if you did and you have it done so perfectly, then I'm, I'm going to go wild. And go wild I did. I had this mug on repeat for days. For days. And then I would just always follow that little urge to come back through it throughout the year as well. Because, oh my gosh, the writing, the singing, the production. Oh, it like the little horn sprinkled all throughout and 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 just the way she used her voice. It was just, it, it was just a, such a great pairing. Oh my gosh. So yeah, honorable mention, man. It, it was, it was absolutely, it, it's ridiculous how great that song is. But there's still one song that I felt just, just was executed just a, just the, just the hair, hair bit more made me listen to it just a little bit more often. And G-Friend got that, man. G-Friend isn't even like one of my favorite groups, but here we are. I told you earlier, it's just such a perfectly crafted song. And to think that when they finally did the full album, you know, the one with Mago on it, the Valpurgis Night, to think that they would go back 
to those past albums to, you know, fill it out to make it full, and they didn't choose Here We Are to be on that project? That was a big old face palm to me, man. I was like, what are you doing? What are, seriously, what are you doing? Because this song is so amazing so amazing that yo this is my song of the year truly that song is that good but what about a full body of work though what about a full body of work well I gotta tell you they're both albums that I talked about before I mean it makes sense right I've been praising so many different projects, so many different artists. It makes sense that the ones mentioned before had to be mentioned here, right? So, my runner-up, my honorable mention for album of the year would have to be Boy Lonely by Russell. Yeah. Like, it was great. Like, what can I say? I kept going back to it over and over and over this year. Like, this project was just a great experience and I loved vibing to it. There was really only one song that I was like, mm, I don't need to listen to this one. But I just started off with respect and protect and I, I'm, I'm set and I just vibe the whole way through singing all the words just like yo this project I am eating it up it's so great it's so great I love this project and that's why it's just the runner up. <laughs> but my favorite album, my favorite album of the year, I didn't even have to listen to all year to know that I enjoyed it just that much more than Boy, Boy Lonely. And that project has to be one of the most fantastic blends the, the most fantastic crossover project I mean the album of the year is the album by Blackpink <laughs> yeah yeah I, I told you, man, the only stipulation why I didn't win K-pop album of the year is because I feel like it's a, it's a global album, man. It is a global album. It has so much English, and it also has the Korean in there, too. But it had so much English, I, I felt wrong putting as the winner the best K-pop album. But an album of the year, where everything is included? <laughs> You, you dang skippy, I'm going to make it number one. Yeah. The album, to me, is another fantastic project. Like, I know there are people who don't like some of the tracks, especially the, some of the tracks it starts off with. How you like that? Ice Cream. Me? I love those. I love those songs. I love them so much. In fact... I'm on so much of the opposite spectrum that Love Sick Girls to me is one of the weaker tracks to me. But I still love it. The whole album from beginning to end, all eight tracks I feel create such a well composed and sequenced project that I just, I love it. It's the perfect album to to really say yo this is my full album this 
is what a full body of work from us would be like. You're gonna have a little bit of this, a little bit of that hip hop, get a little bit of that pop, get a little bit of that K-pop flair. We're gonna blend it all together and here you get Blackpink. We are Blackpink. This is the album by Blackpink. And if you ask me, that junk is pretty savage. Wink. <laughs> no, but yeah, that album is so fantastic. Like, it is certainly something that I will always be in awe over because of how greatly it was put together. Like, was it worth the wait? Well, for me, yeah. Because, I mean, I didn't have to wait four years. <laughs> but. But. I still feel. Overall. Like, for what I feel Blackpink is wanting to do. The crowds they're wanting to reach. The, 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 the audience that they're trying to keep. And the fans they're trying to gain. I feel like it all can be pleased in, with this album. Even if it's not even the entire album, there's something for everybody in it. And I feel it's some of the best executed stuff for the, for the fans of those different styles. And yeah, that's what makes it, to me, my favorite album this year. Yeah, even more than Luna. Like the thing is, I'm gonna just just bring it out here that blows my mind. When I was putting together this list, the fact that I've been loving Luna, watching them this entire year, and they're still my ultimate group. The fact that none of their albums or songs ended up being my absolute favorite this year, I find it amazing. I do. Especially since I liked each of their albums too. Every single one of their songs released this year. But not all of them hit me quite as hard as some of the other projects. Especially the album. Like the way this mug impacted me was like, yo, this is exactly what they needed. This is exactly what they needed to take over the world. And I'm still waiting for that album to come from Lula, but they have already taken over my heart. Oh, I know, I know, crummy joke. But still, that's how I feel. Um, so that's my main list there. Um, and then I always uh, end up throwing in this extra category towards the end since um, some people ask me, since I am an artist, what's my favorite song that I've released? Um, and I haven't really been doing a lot of music at all. Um, so the only song, I only have really two songs to really throw in the ring for this year. So my favorite song that I've released um, is For Real, because the way I spit on that junk was absolutely bonkers. And I feel it's it's the perfect, it's another one of those songs that I feel is a great bridge between super catchy and also very technical all at the same time where you can jam and bop to it and also listen and be impressed by the wordplay, the, the technical um, aspects of it, of the way it's written and you just be like, yo, this, this, this is just dope all around. Um, and so yeah, that's that's uh, my favorite track that I released this year, um, despite it being another year of mm, for major inactivity. But um, yeah, that's it, guys. Um, that was my 2020 musical favorites this year. My notables. Um, and 
hopefully you guys enjoyed this lovely ride with me. Uh, I know it's a long, long journey to get here to the end, but um, hopefully um, if there's something that you haven't checked out that I mentioned, you will do so um, if you think I'm a man of culture and taste. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, and, and until next year, much love, peace, peace.